Uh, thanks, Bob, for that um, kind, if, if a little lengthy, introduction. Uh, uh, so uh, I wanted to thank uh, you for inviting me today to talk about stem cell therapy for stroke. And I also wanted to um, thank very much the um, o CIRM Oversight Committee and everyone at CIRM who's working so hard, uh, contributing their time uh, and efforts um, to um, uh, overseeing the funding uh, of uh, Prop 71, which I think has produced some of the best research, not just in California, but in, uh, in the entire United States. Uh, and the science that's come out of it has been really uh, quite, quite amazing, I think. And uh, we hope that you will continue to um, guide the oversight um, in terms of moving to the next phase, which is uh, translating um, this research into, into clinical therapy for patients. And that's why many of us, including myself, are, are, are doing this. So the brain is a remarkable organ, as many of you know. It um, occupies only 2% of the total uh, uh, weight of the body, yet uh, consumes 15% of the blood flow and 20% of the oxygen consumption. Uh, a stroke is a sudden disability of body function brought about by disruption of blood flow to the brain. And 87% uh, of strokes are caused by thromboembolism. That's a blockage in an artery like the carotid artery uh, or a piece of clot travels north from the carotid or from the heart or another vessel and blocks an artery in the brain or there's an in situ thrombosis in the brain artery or in about 13% of cases there's a hemorrhage, uh, bursting of a blood vessel in the brain and uh, either of these events causes lack of blood flow to the brain, deprivation of the important nutrients, oxygen most importantly and glucose and the brain cells die. It's a major problem throughout the world. It's the third leading cause of death uh, in the United States, second leading cause worldwide. There are almost 800,000 new victims per year. There's a new stroke victim every 40 seconds. Quite sobering statistics. 5.4 million survivors in the US. It's the largest single cause of severe neurologic disability. About a third of patients are unable to care for themselves and three quarters have impaired activities of daily living. We think of stroke as a disease of old or mature people. Uh, however, about a third of people uh, who suffer a stroke are less than 65 years old. So it doesn't affect uh, only the uh, elderly population. It's a major factor in uh, causing late life dementia. And although we used to think of it as a disease of men, it takes a significant toll in women. It's the second leading cause of death in women. Uh, and. Um, in women less than 45 years old, stroke is actually more common than heart attack. We spend, it's been estimated, more than $74 billion a year in total stroke costs. When someone has a stroke, and I'm sure many of you either have relatives or friends who have suffered a stroke, it can cause uh, a multitude of symptoms depending on where the stroke is and the magnitude of the stroke. It can cause weakness, paralysis, numbness, uh, problems with vision, difficulty speaking or language dysfunction, dizziness, clumsiness, falling, uh, severe headache is, is sometimes a symptom, abrupt personality changes or problems with judgment, uh, difficulty swallowing. These are all uh, symptoms and signs of stroke. Currently, there is no treatment that exists to restore lost brain function after stroke. <clears throat> we know that a bone marrow transplant, um, and this is a type of stem cell transplantation, the first one that was actually developed, has uh, been able to cure some blood and lymphoid cancers, uh, as well as other blood disorders. Human cell transplantation is moving quickly into clinical trials for other cancers, diabetes, and heart disease. What about stem cell transplantation for stroke? Can we use this as a strategy to restore neurologic function? We got into this uh, about a decade ago um, when it wasn't so popular to be involved in stem cell therapy. And one of the first experiments we did was to transplant 300,000 human fetal derived neural stem cells. These were stem cells that were derived by uh, special sorting using fluorescent antibody uh, technique. And, uh, they were grown in culture as neurospheres, and then what we did was to cause a stroke in an animal. Uh, this is in a rat, and then uh, a week later, we transplanted either the cells 
or a controlled buffer, and then we immunosuppress the animals because these were human cells transplanted into uh, a non-human rodent. And then at a month later, we looked in, uh, at the brains of the rodents to see uh, how the cells interacted with the brain and how the brain interacted with the cells. One thing we found was that when we transplanted these cells too close to the stroke, this is the stroke here in gray, the cells didn't survive, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, but we were uh, not expecting this. And the reason they didn't sur survive was because the stroke environment is too inhospitable, too much inflammation and not enough blood flow. But when we moved the transplant site several millimeters away from the stroke, we achieved very robust survival. And you can see here where we have stained the cells uh, with an antibody to human cells, so they're, they're dark, they're brown. Uh, we transplant um, here. The cells actually migrate in a targeted fashion to the stroke over uh, a, a course of uh, several millimeters. Uh, and they only go in the direction to the stroke. And this is quite interesting because if we put the cells into an uninjured brain, this is a non-stroke, non-injured brain, the, the cells, the human cells don't move. So the cells are very clever. They pick up cues from the environment that determine where they should go to repair the tissue. Why do the cells migrate? We don't know, but we have some hypotheses. We know that after a stroke, various chemicals called chemokines are given off by the stroke, and it turns out that some of these chemokines interact with receptors on the stem cells. And that probably is one of the reasons that they are attracted to the, to the stroke environment. When the cells reach the, uh, the vicinity of the stroke on the border, in this case, they turn, about half of them turn into immature neurons, and none of them become what are called oligodendrocyte progenitors. These are cells that make the insulation of nerve cells, the myelin, that, allows, that, that allow the nerves to work. You need myelin. Myelin's like insulation on a wire. Uh, electricity won't travel through a, a, a wire efficiently if it doesn't have insulation. So none of these cells become these uh, myelin-producing uh, cells in the brain. Half become neurons. And why this is interesting is because you take these same human stem cells and you put them into a different environment, you put them into a model of spinal cord injury where the myelin breaks down and, you, and is not produced, and now 64% of the cells become myelin producing cells and they remyelinate the nerve. So again, the cells are smart, again, picking up signals from the environment that direct what they need to do in order to repair tissue. In our hands, the cells re recover function, and this is an example in a rat using a particular uh, test of motor function, and you can see that the cell uh, group uh, recovered behavior over a course of about five weeks. Um, Marcel Dotti, a senior scientist in our lab, uh, developed a human embryonic-derived neural stem cell, and this is actually the stem cell that we are moving towards the clinic with. These cells also survive, migrate to the stroke, differentiate or turn into the appropriate cells for that region, and they improve motor deficits in the immunocompromised rats. They don't form tumors, and this is very critical. And you can see here, this is on one cylinder test where we test the contralateral uh, forelimb. Remember, the right brain controls the left body, and that's true in humans and in other species, so that when we cause a stroke on the right side, we examine the left forelimb in the animal. And you can see here, that in yellow, that there's increased use of the contralateral forelimb when in the group that uh, received the cells. We then tried it in another model. This is a newborn model of stroke, and again, transplanting the cells recovers behavior. We gave the cells to Tom Carmichael, who is co-investigator on this uh, CIRM grant with me. He's at UCLA, and he tried it in his lab, the same cells in yet another model. This is now a mouse model of stroke, and the cells also improve recovery of function. And finally, we did it in the third independent laboratory, Murdad Shamlu's lab at Stanford, and again, the cells recover behavior. So now we've shown that these same cells, these human embryonic-derived neural stem cells, uh, improve behavior after stroke in three separate laboratories, uh, two separate species, and three separate models. And that's very important. You, in order to move into the clinic, I think one, one of the problems we've had in the past and, and the, the uh, errors we've made is taking a therapy that's been shown in only one laboratory and assuming that then it's going to work uh, more generically. 
So why did the cells work? We were talking about this earlier today. The initial notion was that these stem cells we put in, they're neural stem cells, they turn into progenitor cells and become the kind of cells that are present in the brain, neurons, astrocytes, and these oligodendrocytes I mentioned, and that they integrate into the circuits and generate new processes and make synapses, which are the connections between neurons. And in fact, they do that. Here's an example of one of our uh, stem cells, and it does make a synapse, and it generates electrochemical uh, potentials. But after almost a decade of work, we don't believe that's the main way that the cells recover behavior. What we think is happening is that these neural stem cells are secreting growth factors, other trophic factors, and chemicals that enhance native mechanisms of recovery in the brain and normal plasticity. So you all know that people recover from a stroke, but adults recover not very well. Children, on the other hand, recover much, much better after a stroke because they have better repair mechanisms. And so what we believe is happening is that these exogenous stem cells we put in are uh, facilitating the environment so that we get nerve sprouting, we get angiogenesis, new blood vessel formation, which is important for uh, recovery of function. We get new synapses from the endogenous cells, and we get neurogenesis that's occurring normally in the brain, but not to a great enough extent. And here's an example of an experiment we did where we put the transplanted cells on this side of the brain near the stroke, and then what we found was that this actually stimulates growth of the processes from neurons on the other side of the brain across the corpus callosum to synapse on the side of the stroke. And similarly, putting cells on this side of the brain causes cells on the other side, neurons on the other side, to grow processes all the way down and sprout axons into the spinal cord. These cells have a very powerful effect on inducing neovascularization, angiogenesis, or new blood vessel formation in the brain. And you can see that here. These are blood vessels stained in green compared with the buffer-treated animals. And we know that the cells secrete VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, and that's, although VEGF has, uh, has really uh, uh, many, many effects um, in the brain and on tissues, one of the main effects, and the reason it was named this, is that it promotes vascular uh, growth, new blood vessels. And we actually then did an experiment to block the VEGF secreted by the human cells. And the way we did this was to use Avastin, which many of you know is an anti-cancer drug made by Genentech. And Avastin is an antibody to human VEGF. It only blocks the human VEGF. It doesn't block the rat VEGF. So we put in the cells and we put in VEGF, uh, we put in anti-VEGF Avastin at the same time, and we find that the Avastin blocks the formation of new blood vessels in the brain, and quite interestingly, it also blocks the recovery of function. So Avastin is important, at least in part, um, in blocking this, uh, the stem cell recovery. It means that the stem cells we're putting in are secreting VEGF, and the VEGF is implicated, at least in part, in that recovery. The stem cells also, very importantly, decrease the inflammatory process after stroke, and, and that inflammatory process, in many ways, is detrimental. That effect also is blocked by Avastin, implying that VEGF is involved in that immunomodulation. So our hypothesis right now is that the cells aid in recovery primarily by secreting factors enhancing endogenous repair mechanisms. VEGF is important. Um, uh, the cells enhance multiple brain repair processes. They don't simply integrate and grow, uh, grow out new uh, axons and synapses. Uh, and these uh, changes induced by the stem cells repair uh, uh, the vessels that correlate with a functional recovery. So our stem cell transplantation offers a multimodal strategy. Now, someone asked me earlier before um, I, we, we started this symposium about mesenchymal cells. These are bone marrow stem cells, and they're being used for many diseases, including uh, 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 cardiac disease and, uh, and heart attack. And they're in clinical trials. And it turns out that um, non-neural human uh, stem cells, bone marrow, umbilical cord, peripheral blood, and adipose tissue um, stem cells, and these are mesenchymal uh, or marrow stromal cells. They also enhance functional recovery, whether delivered 
directly to the brain or whether they are delivered intravenously or, um, or uh, intraarterially. And again, it's probably because they secrete trophic factors and growth factors. The cells don't stick around in the brain, by the way. You can't find them in the brain, even though the, the, the animals get better. Currently, there are four trials which have been completed for stroke, four clinical trials, and I'm going to briefly talk about these. The first two trials used this very interesting cell, which was originally derived from a human embryonic testicular carcinoma that metastasized to a 22-year-old's lung. And the cells were then treated in culture in such a way that they became post-mitotic, meaning they were no longer stem cells, they didn't divide, they're not a tumor, and they never caused a tumor in monkeys, rats, uh, or mice. And they function as CNS, central nervous system progenitor cells. University of Pittsburgh, um, with a large group led by Doug Konziolka, a neurosurgeon, transplanted these cells into 12 patients using a needle and a computer-directed stereotactic frame. And what they found, and they uh, immunosuppressed the patients for two months, what they found in this uh, very uh, early pilot study was that there, was no, there were no safety issues related to the cells. Although it wasn't planned as, a, as an efficacy study because it was too small a number of patients, um, and it was primarily a safety study, they found to their surprise that there was actually a statistically significant benefit in one of the neurologic scales. Half the patients improved uh, on the neurologic scale. <clears throat> and interestingly also, they found that one of the patients died 27 months after implantation. He died of a heart attack and his brain was autopsied and although he was only immunosuppressed for two months, the cells were still viable. You could, you could test that using different kinds of uh, special staining. Uh, and so what this means is, at least in this patient, you don't need to continue to immunosuppress uh, after the initial two months. In fact, we don't even know if we're going to need to immunosuppress patients at all when we transplant human cells to humans. They may lack the, the normal antigenic determinants. That led to a phase two study, which we participated in with University of Pittsburgh, and we treated patients from one to six years after the time of their stroke, and we put in either five million cells or 10 million cells, seven patients eat, and we had four controls, and we immunosuppressed again, this time for six months. All the patients received eight weeks of constraint physical therapy. Do you know what that is? Constraint therapy is where you actually constrain or immobilize the good limb and force use of the impaired limb. It's been shown in animals and actually in patients now that that promotes recovery of function. And then we assess the patients over 12 months. And here you can see I'm putting in the cells. This is an MR scan. It shows the trajectory we plot. And this is all possible now because of computer technology and imaging. We can place very precisely with, with, with an accuracy of about one to two millimeters the cells into the area around the stroke. This is done under local anesthetic. Patients go home the next day. And we found no cell-related adverse effects. And I'm going to show you one patient that we treated. This is a 59-year-old physician's assistant who suffered a stroke, had right-sided paralysis, couldn't speak very well. He recovered his speech and four and a half years later was left with right arm and leg weakness. Four and a half years after a stroke, there is almost no uh, chance that he would recover function. It's too far out. Most of the recovery after stroke is in the first six months and certainly very little after a year. Now he's going to be asked to do a few tasks. He's taking a hollow cylinder and putting it on a wooden dowel. This is before the stem cell transplant. And now he's being asked to take a washer and put that washer on the dowel. And he can't lift it up even. He doesn't have the dexterity. And this is a marble he's going to be asked to put up on this tray, which he can't do. I'm going to show you what he looks like seven months after the neural progenitor cell transplant. Here he now is taking this hollow cylinder and he's putting it on the dowel and now he's taking the washer and putting it on the wooden stick and now this is a ball bearing which is a dif more difficult task than a marble because it's smaller and slicker and so she's impressed <laughs> So remember, this was not, this was not designed as, as, as an efficacy study either. It's, I'm showing you one of our best patients. Obviously, it's an N of one, and I don't want to oversell this. But if we could achieve even this kind of recovery, which is, uh, makes a difference in patients uh, as an early result, I think this would be uh, really quite um, important. 
And um, in this study, we also showed a, in a subgroup, and this was a group um, of the patients at Pittsburgh, that uh, on memory testing, there was a significant improvement in memory uh, testing. And this is six months later. And here's one patient I'll show you um, that had an improvement on visual spatial processing. This patient was asked before the uh, transplant to reproduce this drawing here, and this was uh, the uh, effect. This was his um, attempt at it six months later with no um, rehearsal. Um, he was able to do um, quite a bit better. This is a tough task. I'm not sure how I would do on re re reproducing that. At any, uh, at any rate, um, what we found was that um, there was no change in our primary outcome, um, although we almost reached statistical significance uh, with regard to the baseline, which was the primary outcome. We called this a negative trial, but secondary outcomes that we had uh, planned beforehand actually showed statistically significant benefits uh, in terms of activities, uh, memory testing, and some motor functions um, that would make a difference in patients' lives. It did show that these cells can be produced in culture, preserved, um, they can be cryopreserved and implanted safely. Um, we showed it was safe and feasible. Um, what happened to the, this technology? Well, the company Leighton that developed it went bankrupt. The um, venture capital group that took over was looking for someone to develop it, and now it lays dormant. And that's why it's so important that we have um, money like Sir Money that, that, that will allow us to, to continue to move these, these projects into the clinic. Um, I'll tell you briefly about the third trial that was done. This was a trial done in Boston. This was transplanting uh, fetal pig cells into the brain. Um, I doubt we're going to be using pig cells uh, into the brain, but this was um, one of the thoughts uh, a number of years ago. And five patients were treated, um, and it, uh, the FDA actually terminated the study after there were two adverse effects, probably not related to the cells. One was a, uh, a venous stroke, probably from the, the actual the transplant procedure, and the other, patient, the other was a patient who developed um, hyperglycemia to, with a glucose of 630. Normal glucose is, is about 100 um, uh, to 150. Um, and so whether it should have been stopped is not clear, but that was stopped. And the last trial that was been, been completed was done in Korea. And here, this is a different approach. This is using the mesenchymal bone marrow-derived stem cells from the same patient. So these patients came in with a stroke, 10 patients. They had a bone marrow aspirate. The, the bone marrow cells were then isolated and cultivated. Uh, and then one to two months later, they were transplanted back into the same patients intravenously, and 100 million cells were injected. And these were big strokes which would be tough to recover function from. And uh, as expected, there was no difference in the clinical outcome on neurological scales. But interestingly, there was a statistically significant benefit in terms of the amount of atrophy that the patient showed later. So the patients that had the stem cells delivered had less atrophy of the brain. Who knows what this means? It was only 10 patients. Again, these are all early trials. They're mostly safety trials. Currently, there are a number of trials that are being conducted throughout the world. There are five trials, one in the US, that are all using autologous, that means from the same person, bone marrow or peripheral blood cells. That's the easiest because you don't have immune problems and there's a long history of using uh, bone marrow transplant or, or same person uh, uh, blood transfusion. Um, there are two other trials which are underway. They've been approved. One is. Um, uh, is being conducted by Sandbio, a uh, biotech company in uh, Mountain View locally. Um, and they're using marrow stromal cells, again, uh, again uh, blood cells, um, uh, which are manipulated to transiently express a gene, which changes them a little. Uh, we and University of Pittsburgh are the two sites in the country that will be doing this study. We'll probably be starting it in the next few months. That's going to be implantation of these marrow stromal cells directly into the brain not intravenous or intraarterial. And the second study that is underway is uh, a company in, in England, in London, and they're using uh, an immortalized cell line. Uh, they wanted to do the company here. They couldn't get it through the FDA, so they abandoned that approach, and they're doing it in, in England. So to conclude, there are many unresolved issues. Um, we talked about some of these. What cell is going to be the best? Is it going to be an embryonic-derived fetal, adult? Are we going to be using IPS, new technology, where you can derive stem cells without going through, uh, without having to, to, to harvest the cells uh, from a, uh, a human embryo or a fetus. Um, which cell is going to be the best type? 
I touched on this. Is it going to be neural? Is it going to be a mesenchymal from bone marrow peripheral blood? Are we going to have to modify the cells with uh, genes uh, to produce growth factors or neurotransmitters? Maybe not. They seem to do pretty well by themselves. They're very smart, as I mentioned. How will we deliver them? How many cells? Where do we deliver them? What's the timing, acutely or chronically? Uh, how do we select patients? Do we need to immunosuppress? Um, how do we control the cells? We, uh, we had a problem when, when um, uh, we transplanted uh, fetal tissue into the brain for Parkinson's disease. We could uh, show that those cells actually make dopamine and, re re and correct the problem that Parkinson patients had, but the patients developed dyskinesias, mo excessive movement, because we couldn't control how much dopamine was secreted. This may be an issue with, with stem cells. We don't know. Um, Long-term toxicity, outcome measures, um, we think it's important, and so does the FDA, actually, to look at mechanisms. We don't want a black box of simply putting a cell in and showing that it recovers function. We want to know how it works, um, and that helps us to design better strategies for, for uh, recovering function. And if we're ever going to get this to patients, we're going to have to track these cells long term without sacrificing the patients like we do with animals. And so we've been working on that in the lab. There are different ways of doing it. Um, we've uh, chosen MR scan, which is uh, now used quite widely. Raphael Guzman, who was a postdoc with me and now is one of our faculty members, spearheaded this study. And what he did was to um, transfect the uh, stem cells in culture with a uh, super paramagnetic nanoparticle of iron. So put iron into the cells. It's integrated into the cell. It doesn't change the biological characteristics of the cell electrically or in other features. And then you can see, this is in a rat brain, you transplant the cells. Iron shows up as black in the brain. Here's at one week post-transplantation. Now you can follow the cells because they've got black iron in them and they're migrating here to the stroke. So this may be a very, very useful. And, and this is being done in patients now uh, following stem cells that are labeled with iron. In conclusion, I personally believe that stem cell transplantation for stroke and other neurologic diseases holds great promise. There's been a lot of hype about stem cells, but I believe over the next probably two decades we will see really quite um, remarkable advances in terms of uh, treating patients. Um, it's still in its very early stages. There are many issues we need to resolve preclinically. Some people accuse me and others uh, uh, in terms of the clinical trials being ahead of the science. I don't believe that. I think we need to um, move into uh, early phase studies in patients as long as we can do it safely because we learn so much from uh, studying patients who uh, are treated with, with stem cells um, uh, that we can never learn from treating rats and mice. Uh, the key is to do it safely because we don't want to set back the field, which, which, which would happen if we had an adverse effect like we had with gene therapy many years ago. Um, so we want to be very, very careful, but we must move it, I feel, into patients at this stage, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we received, as, uh, as you heard, a, um, uh, a grant for $20 million to move this uh, therapy into the clinic. Um, it's, we've only been doing this now. We're actually just submitted our six-month report um, to, to CIRM. Uh, this is a huge amount of work, even more than I had expected initially. Um, it includes science uh, and preclinical mechanisms, but also includes many more processes of how do you characterize the cells, develop assays, how do you uh, transfer the technology from our laboratory into a manufacturing group, um, toxicology is, uh, and pharmacology studies, um, and uh, a huge amount of regulatory issues. Um, we have put together, I think, a stellar team uh, of people from academics, uh, from uh, industry, from uh, FDA uh, regulatory point of view, um, along with a um, ethics and patient advocacy advisory committee and scientific advisory committee. And I want to acknowledge everyone. I won't mention them all here, but they are a fantastic team to work with. And I think uh, we have a, uh, a great chance of moving this um, into the clinic. Uh, our goal is to be one of, the, um, one of the disease teams that actually makes it to an IND um, within four years. 
And um, I want to thank, uh, finally, all the uh, people in my laboratory um, my, uh, who contributed to this and my collaborators at Stanford, many of the faculty who made all this possible and allowed us to actually uh, receive this grant. Um, hopefully, we will, we will see um, over the next uh, one to two decades uh, patients who um, have improved outcome after stroke with this type of therapy. So thank you very much for your attention.